Namaste. Welcome to a new Paradigm of Education podcast. I'm your host, Monique Sayers, along with Anish Daya. Today we have our very special guest with us, and her name is Julie Boyer. A new Paradigm of Education is an awakening in education. It's a place of transformation that comes from within and then centers around us being able to then transform that out into our students and into humanity and into our children. I feel really grateful to be able to connect with different people that come on our podcasts every week that all share their beautiful gift and message that is so needed to be shared and heard by others in order to help us to really transform the energy of what education was and what it already is, because we already know this new paradigm of education is here right now. So our guest today is Julie Boyer. And she's a gratitude expert and a gut and health expert. She's the founder of Wake Up With Gratitude. And she hosts a podcast uh, also in the same name, which Anesh and I have, have actually both been on. So you could check out those episodes as well as her others. Julie has also been unschooling her daughter, who is now 11 for the past four years. Welcome, Julie. It's so beautiful to have you with us today. Oh, thank you. I'm so grateful for this beautiful connection to talk about a lot of the things that don't normally intersect with a podcast, but here we are. Wonderful. It's funny how we said the same thing about language and gratitude. Yes, we did. <laughs> here we are. We did. So. That's what I love is like, there's never, we just never run out of ways to think and talk about gratitude. And so I love that. Just this feel into this gratitude, this field of gratitude that we've just been working on. Um, Julia Nesh and I have just been placing ourselves in this field of gratitude and really for, with the inspiration of this being able to be let out to everybody who's listening today and also to our children and to other educators and parents. And I really do feel the energy of gratitude um, is the key of, of life. And it's not separate from anything else. It's all one and the same. And it needs to be embodied in a way that um, is a daily practice, almost like the way you're brushing your teeth or, um, you know, doing homework. Not that we want to do homework, but you know what I'm saying. Um, and so from this place is where I feel like um, a new paradigm of awakened gratitude is just, is just within us. And I go all a bit crazy when I talk about gratitude because I really love the topic and I've been practicing it, it many years. And what I will actually want to do is just hand it over to Julie, who's here today, because she's also um, an advocate for gratitude. And I'd love to just hear your, um, your gift that you could share with us about how gratitude can enlighten us all, because it's such a gift that you're sharing. Thank you. Gratitude, you know, for me, I've been on a, a journey for a number of years, developing my own gratitude practice and being a podcast host, getting to interview people on a weekly basis around their gratitude practices and their ways that gratitude shows up in their life. It's been, I've learned so much and I'm still learning. And I think where I am right now in my gratitude journey and practice is really focusing on how gratitude just is a part of the way I show up in the world. So when I first really started practicing gratitude, it was very listicle and list-based and, and I still do that, but, and that's great. I don't want to diminish the power of creating a list of things that we are grateful for. I think for many people, that's the first door into the world of practicing gratitude. But what I've been really focusing on and trying to just get in deeper on is that how do I because wherever you go, there you are. So how do I show up as best as I can with gratitude as just part of my being? So I'll just give a short example. This morning, I went to the beach, got up early. You know, it's the sunrise is getting pretty early now. And so setting the alarm before 6 a.m., I don't love that. But I changed, I created a special, I just did this. I created a special alarm now and I call it sunrise because it's going to keep getting earlier and earlier. So I made a special alarm just for sunrise, you know, and I got up and I, I went back to a beach that I used to go to quite often when I lived, you know, in that area, not far, 10 minutes away. And I was by myself on this beach and I just felt a lot of gratitude for the experiences that I'd had while I was living there, the experiences that I'd had on that beach, the 
just the ability to be close to so many beaches to watch the sunrise whenever I choose to. And just gratitude for this peace, you know, this quiet, just me and the waves and the seagulls gratitude that I was seeing seals in the water. And at this beach, there are bald eagles. So there were like four eagles that flew by. And I really just felt like in that moment, as I'm walking along the beach, I'm just in gratitude. So that's where I am today. Mm, I love that. Thank you so much for, um, sharing that and there's so much wisdom um that we can learn by being at the beach you know people might be thinking well what's that got to do with education or or what is that but i think being able to quieten the mind and look at the sunrise you know feel into the energy of the animals um all of this forms part of our um synthesis with education which then transforms later into other creative things that we we might make like books or we might you know be doing a project at school with the children and all of this helps us to ground in and then to physically bring in those actual um gifts that we want to want children to create if we're, we're creating that as a new form of a curriculum for example yeah something my, really oh, sorry, sorry go ahead go ahead. go ahead julie no i was just going to mention that you know my daughter because we do this unschooling thing and you know there are times when like many children, you know, she's sad or not feeling great or like her mind is, you know, not being kind to her. Like she's having problems with self-talk or whatever it is. And I'm like, we need to go to the beach. She is much like me. She like needs that grounding near the water. And so, you know, we just leave the house and we spend the afternoon, just even 20 minutes at the beach. And it really brings her back, resettles her. And I think that part of teaching our children where to go to ground yourself, Mm. where to go when you're having a hard day, like knowing what those places are for you. I think that is like, it's a very, very important life lesson that she, she learns and she doesn't always. And there are times that I literally drag her and I'm like, get in the car. We have to go. You have to come with me. She's like, I don't want to do it. I'm like, trust me, please come. (laughs) And then by the time we get to the beach, you know, she's already settling down. And then when we leave, she's like, you're right. I needed to come to the beach. So fits right into how I am sort of educating my child. I'm just educating my child to be the best human being of herself that she can be right of that, her particular human being. And there's so much power to exactly what you both just said. And not that everyone has access to a beach 10 minutes away. I had to go to Cuba for that, but it could be an object, it could be a stone. It's about triggering a, a memory or a, maybe a thought or something that grounds you, that takes you back to a place or a time where you are grateful for something. And so when we talk about building gratitude into locations, for me, every day when I meet my students outside, we meet at a different location throughout the city, but each location that we go to There's a a point of gratitude for maybe a conversation I had with someone there. One of my students had while we were there. Like I remember we were in front of Queens Park in the dead of winter. um, And it was just happened to be during Remembrance Day. We were asking people, what does Remembrance Day mean to you? And it was snowing and there was a statue of Canada's first prime minister, Sir John A. Macdonald, who, you know, And there's a lot of history around that, but, you know, this, the idea that we were in a free country, that we could breathe in fresh air, that this woman gave us time to chat with us, to talk about, you know, it was a time to remember all the people who had sacrificed their lives to, to allow us to be here to where we are. And, you know, we should be grateful. Like, little locations throughout the city, like every part of Toronto, point of gratitude for every place that we go to. And Mm -hmm. imagine as a language learner, if you can connect different locations. So we go to this one library called Robarts Library. It's named after John P. Robarts, who was premier of Ontario. And then we get into three levels of government. You know, we're grateful to have a somewhat, you know, great democratic system, so to speak, here in Canada, um, compared to a lot of other places in the world. 
But then, you know, we have Tommy Douglas, who was premier of Saskatchewan, who brought universal health care. I'm grateful. So it's like all these connections of gratitude just from this one library. And when students can make those connections, like we call it conversation mind mapping with locations throughout the city, they, they see nothing but places to be grateful for. So they step outside of a subway station and that location, it's not the beach, but it's like, right, Young Street, Young Station, the longest street in the world, named after you know George Young, who was Secretary of War and friends with John Graves Simcoe, who founded Toronto, what that used to be called York. So everything is connected, all these things that we can be grateful for around locations. Right? And, and so I, I so appreciate you both understanding the power of <laughs> having access to a beach, and, but also just it could be an object or it could be a location wherever you are. And like Julie said, constantly being present in the moment of attitude, wherever you are and how you show up. I love, I love, I love how you um, bring that lens into your students, Anesh. You know, here we are with some language lovers, learners that have arrived in Canada, and you know they could be learning anything. And here you are showing them not only a location and the language associated with that location, but also the feeling of gratitude and the language associated with being gratitude as well. You know, that's really special to be able to to bring that in and really inspiring for. Um, any kinds of educators or parents, like where am I at this moment and what could I be doing that brings in that feeling of gratitude and let's talk about it, let's play with it, let's meditate, let's do a gratitude in all the different ways possible. Children need variety and students need variety as well. So I just, I love the variety that you've just brought in to the conversation. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so I'd love to hear a little bit more about you, Julie. Um, you mentioned your daughter is unschooling and, or, you know, it's, you, she, she started out as home, being homeschooled, or I'd love to hear the story um, or how all of this came about, you know, that would be really beautiful. Thank you. Sure. And I share the story with her permission. I've asked her many times if it's okay if I share this story with her, because it is, there's some trauma in the story as well. Okay. So we're from Ontario where Anesh lives and we moved across the country to live in British Columbia. And when we first moved uh, here, we lived on the mainland uh, in a place called Langley in a townhouse that we bought sight unseen. So energetically, like the house wasn't great. And I know you really tap into energy, Monique, so you understand. My daughter, I think, had potentially some encounters with spirits in her room and like she couldn't sleep in her room. But beyond that, very much um, this separation anxiety was pretty extreme. And what happened was moved in December. She went to school for like four or five days and then it was Christmas break. And the Christmas break was two and a half weeks. And when she was to go back to school in January, she just didn't want to go. And at first I was like, you know, normal new school, maybe you're nervous, but it progressively got worse and worse. Like, really bad to which she was having panic attacks about going to school. Um, I mean, we tried everything to get her to go to school. And what's so hard is from the outside, so many people that love and care about me were like, why can't you just get your kid to go to school? And I was like, I, I honestly, I promise you I'm trying as hard as I can um, to the point where there were times when I physically like pushed my daughter into the school and like walked away because the, the principal and the teacher were like, she just has to get, once she's in the school, she's fine. We'll take care of her. No, I found out later that she'd had like a panic attack and was like banging her head on the wall in the bathroom, like, which the principal never told me about. So it got really bad. And at one point she said to me, um, mom, the kids at school have knives in their backpack and they want to hurt me and they want to kill you like me. Now, this was not happening, okay? There was no incidents of bullying or anything. Like, I'm clear on that. But she was so afraid to be away from me. She was so afraid of being in that school without me that she thought she was going to die or that I was going to die if we were apart. And so I drove her right into the doctor's office. I was like, my kid needs help. Like she's seven years old. What is happening? This is frightening. 
And so, um, you know, that started our journey. You know, we got into, we were able to get emergency counseling from my husband's office because he had just started a new job, but they let us use their emergency counseling services. You know, we got help um, almost right away. And we met that counselor and she said like, and my daughter had really not been going to school. Like my daughter, my, the counselor was like, you need to pull your child from school. Are you, there will be like serious lifelong consequences if you don't get your kid out of school. So we pulled her out of school and I had known in my heart for weeks that this is what I needed to do. And I'm just saying this to like the parents right now who are like, do I take my child out of school? And hopefully you're not in the same kind of trauma that we were. But I say this to say, like if your intuition is screaming at you to get your child out of school for whatever the reason is, listen to yourself because I knew in my heart that she had to be pulled from school officially and others around me were like, just keep trying. So we finally, you know, that's where our journey started as we finally pulled her from school. And I'll just, I just pause for a moment. I don't know if you want to you to continue with where we went from there, but that's sort of how we ended up pulling her from school. Wow. She was just seven. That's unbelievable. And for her to be able to um, speak with you and it be that distinct, it's, it's unbelievable. I don't actually have words, words um, for this, but I'm really grateful that you're here to share this because I feel like somebody else um, we'll need to hear this. We we'll need to hear this. Um, so maybe we can just continue on because I'm really intrigued, actually. Sure. I mean, so then you have a child that has serious mental health issues, right? She is very unwell. And we were able to see this counselor at no charge because it was like emergency counseling for a little bit. But then, then I was not able to work. So I've been working from home at that time, right? I have, I am like the gratitude I have for the business that I do, I do network marketing and I had income still coming in, even though there was no way that I could work. We went to the school and they told us, they said, okay, so now that you're homeschooling, I didn't even know what that was. Um, you need to go online and download the curriculum for grade two. And then you're just going to teach her the curriculum. I was like, yeah, okay. I had background is I've been a teacher. I've taught overseas. I was like, yeah, no problem. I'm going to just teach my kid the whole entire grade two curriculum while dealing with like a severe mental illness and all this. I was like this. Yes. I'm like, that sounds fine. Sounds good. And so I, you know, so this is how we started. And I, I have tremendous gratitude for a friend. We met, we met a friend through a homeschooling group who happened to speak French like us. We connected really closely. Our kids got along and we would meet at the pool on a regular basis. And one day, like two months in, I was like, I can't do this. Like I cannot, we, the teaching isn't working. She's like still not well. Like we are fighting all the time. It was so terrible. She's still at 11 years old. We'll say, I hated that time when we were in Langley, we were fighting every day. And she said, she gave me the gift and said, she's like, it doesn't have to be like that. And I was like, what, I don't, what do you mean? Like, I don't know. And she's like, yeah, you can do this thing. Like this unschooling. I don't know if she called it unschooling, but she's like, you don't have to teach her the curriculum. You can just like be her parent. And I was like, what? She's like, yeah, you don't have to do that. Like, no, you're not required to. So that was where I just like started to shift and was like started, then I started exploring like, you know, all these different books about what unschooling looks like and what all that looks like. And we, we then moved, you know, that summer, or I guess that fall, which really helped move to Vancouver Island, which immediately did help her mental health for a while. Anyway, the, it took us two years to figure out what unschooling really looked like for our family. And it doesn't look like what anybody else looks like, but now at 11 it, and it works for us. And I just got tired of people judging how I care for my child. She will not go back to school. She is very clear. Four years later, she still has trauma. We have seen counselors. She has had the support she needs. She just doesn't want to go back to school. And so therefore I will keep her home. And now it works. Like I finally, you know, last year, 2021 was the first year I actually like grew in my business for the first time in like four years. Cause I was actually able to really work again. Wow. 
that's amazing um, about the unschooling. And yeah, I guess um, it's becoming a lot more normalized now since the pandemic, like the pandemic has kind of changed everything. But yeah, just a few years back, people wouldn't have even considered it. They would have just said, okay, like what you're saying, these kind of ideas and stories around, you know, just following the mold of school and sticking it out and everything. And I'm just so happy that you listened to your daughter and that you're there for her and for her, her greater education, which is her growth and her confidence and her joy and her love. That is the most important part of education to, to be receiving and everything else that comes through is just um, extra learning. And that, and it's silly to even imagine a child can learn when they're so um, disturbed, like I know in a classroom, like if a child is agitated, like even if a fly is buzzing around, like something so simple, you know, it doesn't have to be even be like this big trauma, they won't learn. They just, they're not interested. It has to come from that place within them where they're, okay, I'm feeling good inside. I'm excited. Okay, now what is it I can do? And so what I love about this unschooling journey, probably that you can share with us is like um, the creative aspect that your daughter can kind of lead the way, you know, with what she chooses. Yeah. would you like to share something with that so maybe some parents could get some ideas or how you how you went yeah. about all that yeah and I want to just pause to mention something about if a child doesn't feel safe they can't learn so she didn't feel safe for a really long time so right just like if your child doesn't feel safe like some kids right now in my mom's group someone posted you know my child is so anxious to get COVID at school they don't want to bring it home to the family they are not like, do I keep this child home? And I was like, if that, if you can do that and that works for you, then yes, do that. Because a child who does not feel safe, who goes to school anxious every day, can't learn. So the child-led learning part, which is contrary to everything you've ever thought about education, really. I mean, not this, not people who are listening here, but for most people, this is not how they think. So this is the way that I try and explain it to people. So I'm an entrepreneur. I've been in business now for 16 years. And when I started my business, like Zoom didn't exist, Canva didn't exist, Facebook didn't exist, all of these things and modality podcasting, like none of it existed. So what did I have to do to become a podcaster? I had to learn how to become a podcaster. I had to either take a course, read a book, watch a video, try it myself and fail, whatever, right? That's how we learn as adults. It is the same for children. And yet we feel that if we don't feed them the information, they're not going to learn. Trust me, they're already learning. So like, she's super fascinated about lizards and snakes and all this. And she watches like a ton of YouTube videos about all these things. And, you know, that really excites her. And she can like tell you all these things about snakes and lizards and stuff that like, I don't know about, and I don't really care about, but she will tell me all about it. Um, she taught herself how to read and write in English playing Minecraft. So she had been to school all in French. At that point, she spoke English, but she didn't know how to read or write in English at seven because she was in French. She taught herself through Minecraft. Oh, by the way, uh, when she got Minecraft at age six, before we did unschooling, my husband and I both told her, if you want to play Minecraft, we're not helping you. You're going to have to figure it out. So we just told her like on the YouTube videos, she would like, it was, I would see her watching a YouTube video, pause it, do the thing in Minecraft, then do the video again and figure it out. Like that is how we learn. And so I just allow her to just learn. And she's super passionate about horseback riding. So now every game she plays or like everything is all around horses. She does role-playing for horses and she's an only child. So just you know, I had this like preconception that, uh, if you had an only child, you couldn't homeschool. It was like, I don't know why I didn't think you could do it with one child, but you can do it with one child. It's totally okay. Love it. Um, and my daughter, a big fan of Minecraft <laughs> as well. And it's interesting because each child requires a different approach as well and understanding how they each best learn as well is really important. I find with my daughter, like, I could give her Minecraft and she'll explore and she's created now a YouTube channel of all the different worlds and houses and architecture that she's built and how they're all connected. And she's explaining, you know, even just from developing her own server, now connect other players, family, friends, and bring, so we we'll have to connect our kids to obviously. Um, and then to the point of, changing education 
my daughter and her cousins came, transformed our living room into their own school on their own. They had different classes. Each class was like five and a half minutes long because that's as much as they can actually learn, you know, and the, the curriculum and how they taught it was very fun and engaging. And we had substitute teachers come in at like a two minutes in and it's just like all the things that they would ever want. It was customized in-person learning and it was fun and engaging. And it's like they created their own school in my in our living room here. And you know, the fact that they're having to create their own spaces of learning and, and how they want to learn outside speaks volumes to them saying, we know how we want to learn to the fact to the point where we're actually teaching each other how we want to learn. <laughs> And they're like, Daddy, can you be a student too? I'm like, yeah, this sounds amazing. Um, and, and so it, it's just, it's amazing how with my daughter specifically, it's it's giving that exploration, that the I the the space to be able just to create and 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 try different things, but sometimes just introducing little tools. It's like, well, I want to create these Minecraft videos and record my screen. So how do I do that? And and I said, oh, well, you can connect the mic and you just, you know, on your iPad, you click record here and you can talk over it and your face in the corner. Says, oh, okay, got it. And she said, well, I want to, you know, create a, a singing music video. You know, can we use your microphone and your ring light and connect it on? I said, well, I want to edit the video. I want to edit the sound. Now she can do video editing and sound editing. And it's just giving them the tools to be able to do these things and kind of showing them some of the tools and they're like, okay, daddy, I got it. She just finished editing a feature, a feature length movie um, that she created with her cousins. And she did all the video editing, you know, script writing. And did she created the script with her cousins online, you know, typing through Google Docs. And so, and I was just a videographer, film this, film this, cut, action, all of it. And it was just great. And she edited and ex exported the video. I'll have to share it with you, but all of this is all outside of school, just giving them the tools and space to explore and have fun with it all. So I hear you. I, um, it's so funny. My daughter wanted to edit videos too. She has a YouTube channel as well. And so she wanted to edit her videos. So she, my husband does video editing. Like we both, my husband and I both have YouTube channels as well. My husband does video editing. And so he, she's like, can I have a copy of the video editing program? Cause I want to do it. And like, no one taught her how to use it. She just had to figure it out. So now she actually helps me with um, doing video clips from my podcast. Like I get her to help me with it. Not that I can't do it, but for a number of reasons, sure. it's just not something I was doing. So now she does it. She helps me with it. And then I pay her. Cause she's helping me my business. So she earns $5 an hour when she helps me with my business. And she doesn't always, you know, sometimes it's good. Sometimes we fight a little bit, but again, she's using those skills and I'm like teaching her how to use it for business. But she's just like, well, I just want to make fun YouTube videos with my friends. I'm like, that's great. Keep doing that. So just, I think, and I'm sure you talk about this a lot, Monique and, you know, and Anesh in your, in through your podcast and through the theme, I know in your group, it's this understanding that um, learning is happening, whether like someone's telling you how to learn or what to learn or not. And so I think my, my role sort of as a parent is to, as best as I can, provide a safe and loving environment for her to be able to grow. Now, I also, I have a, the privilege of being able to work from home, have a business that has this flexibility so that I can be online. My husband also, you know, has been working from home since COVID. There were sacrifices, right? There were two years where my business, I ran my numbers. Like I dropped 20% of revenue the first year and another 20% the second year. That was hard. Um, but I was still like, if it had a job and had zero income, our financial situation would have been far more dire. And I don't know where my daughter's mental health would have been. So I definitely understand that like I'm in a place of that privilege where I can be home and you know that she's home with me. Yeah, I think it's incredible that we, you're able to uh, lead your daughter through that type of process, as well as you and Nesh, you've both, both of you have come from entrepreneurial backgrounds uh, by choice. And I think that that is really 
uh, useful for children to be learning because yeah the old paradigm of schooling is where you know the children are spoon fed the information whereas I love what you're sharing is well no we're about innovation and you need to do this I love what you were sharing Julie like I'm not going to help you you need to go and do this for yourself and that is such a huge life skill to be able to give to your daughter as well and I, I really feel like that is definitely um, what this new paradigm is because the children are all going to be learning um, in this way. So it's going to become just a natural normalized expectation. So when they're kind of grown up, this will be normalized. And then for their children, it will be normalized. So I really see this system that's already there, just useless, like completely useless, you know, like, I think it's just stepping stones to get to that place. But it's, it's people like yourselves and everybody who's listening, who's just taking little steps with their children and their students to innovate and just to show them different ways of, um, different experiences because we all know that they, they're going to need different ways of learning but just giving them that choice um, outside of this little box of education which we all know already on a new paradigm has shifted as, as you were saying Julie so that's amazing do you have any like tips as well for parents like with unschoolers because I know it's got that I, I also have just one daughter as well right and so I've always had that feeling of well what about the connection with other children what about the socialization like that's maybe a typical question people might want to know about what do you do with your daughter in that way well the answer was very different before COVID because we were out all the time. We had tons of homeschooling friends that we would spend time with and we were out with, you know, kids all the time. And I think, I mean, all kids are socialized less since COVID, like for many different reasons, right? So my daughter, like her father and to a certain degree, me is an online gamer. She loves playing online games. So I found a great group on Facebook is for kids that are unschooling gamers. Their parents are there, obviously. Now, this group is very clear. There is no judgment. There's no screen time limits. There's no judgment about games. There's no, like it is a no judgment zone. It is my kid is playing this, this, and this game. We're looking for friends to play with that and that community. And it's really nice because even just saying this on your podcast, I'm like a little nervous. Cause I'm like, Oh my God, someone's going to judge me because my kids on her screen, like half the day and playing with friends. She has so many friends. My kid has more friends than I do actually, because since the pandemic, my social circle shrank like to, you know, almost zero. It's just starting to grow a little bit again, but she has so many friends. My husband has very few friends IRL, but he has like dozens and dozens of friends through gaming online and communities that he's built through gaming online all over the world. So you know, that my daughter, her best friend lives in India, <laughs> right? She plays with kids in New Zealand. She plays with kids in the States. There's no, what's so cool about this is there's no limits. And just like kids playing with kids, like in, you know, in like a playground or a classroom situation, like sometimes there's a bit of drama, not a ton, thankfully, but you know, and she's been very, she's not on social media. So she's been able to avoid any of that you know, online bullying. Although I have read that uh, the amount of online bullying has decreased since um, through COVID because so many kids weren't in school, <laughs> weren't in the college, like, weren't in the physical school. So yeah, that's a, that's a telling sign that like our school system isn't working the way that it is. So um, yeah, so that's for us, like that community has been so important for her. And we've met, you know, we've met a few friends that she plays with in real life every once in a while, but she really like every day she wakes up to go play with her friend that's in India and she's excited for it. And then they chat. And sometimes I had to remind her, I'm like, I'm recording right now. She's like, I'm not playing with anybody right now. Okay. Like it's okay. <laughs> Cause they get very loud <laughs> and excited. Mm. So, and the other thing too, is that most kids that are unschooled that I know are not, are also able to speak to adults a lot more easily than other children might be able to, because they are with adults often more often. And they're, they're the age of the play groups is not just their own age. Right. I think my daughter, her friends that she plays with, like are anywhere from like nine to 16, which is not common. You don't see like a nine-year-old playing with an 11 or 12 year old, like necessarily on the playground at school. Yeah. I love that. 
the fact that they can also get different vocabulary and languages and ways of speaking from kids that are older, that lexicon yeah. just grows, you know. Um, well, and like, like my, different my, cultures, cultures, right? Absolutely. Different food, like they just, right? There's different things that she's exposed to just because she has friends all over the world. I did not have friends all over the world when I was 11 years old, right? How cool is that? So that's how the social, I mean, that's how the socialization happens. So I feel very confident that um, it's such a, it's a myth. It's a myth. And you can have a child who goes to school and is extremely inverted, inver, uh, inverted, introverted and socially awkward, and they don't have any friends. And it's just, just because they go to school doesn't mean automatically that a child is going to be well socialized or have friends. Unfortunately, when I think about a new paradigm of education, it's this acceptance that an online world isn't going to disappear. And sometimes an online world is the safest place for a child. Sometimes. Okay. There's always going to be dangers, of course, but there's, I mean, there's dangers everywhere. So, you know, do what you need to do as a parent to make sure your child is safe online, but also know that your child might actually have their safest place might be through online because they can't find that community in person locally. Thanks for sharing that and bringing that element into our podcast. You're the first person to talk about this, actually. So it's it's nice to have some diversity. And yeah, the, the world of um, technology is always is going to be present with us. Um, so yeah, it's just getting a balance of what's working within your own homes. And um, I know this, like the simulation, the meta um, simulation, and that I know that that will also be, be coming into some kind of form of education in the future as well, which will allow students to almost appear in a country. So I can imagine with your programs, Inesh, you could just go wild with <laughs> learning about all the countries of the world with their real forms if you're not able to travel. You know, that's like another no, innovative way. We have way. the VR yeah. headset, the VR headset, and, you know, I've had certain companies actually approach me saying can you just wear this headset and we have virtual worlds that you can walk around and take your students to the cafe to the restaurant to the supermarket and they're walking right next to you from the comforts of their own living room and they're interacting with their you know avatars and everything else so there's language learning making the world your classroom from your living room I love the concept of an avatar um, because that's a big gaming thing. And an avatar can be as much like you or as not like you as you want to be. And that's what's so much fun. You know, I was making an avatar for a game that I'm playing right now. A new game just launched and I was making my avatar, like my character. And it's uh, my character uh, identifies as he, him. You can choose your pronouns, which I freaking love, right? You can choose she, her, he, him, they, them, whatever you want. So fun. So my daughter chose a non-binary character. She's like, why not? Before we close, I'd love, Julie, would you like to offer any final gratitude tips or anything that could help um, either parents or students? It's a nice way of closing, feeling that energy mm -hmm. again. <laughs> Absolutely. So infusing gratitude in your day is, I think, the easiest way to start any kind of gratitude practice. Um, one that I like that, can be good for families. So those with children or even older children is around mealtime. And mealtime can be a, a sacred time for the family. If you're bringing everybody to a table, even if you're doing this once a week, bringing everyone to the table, putting, you know, the food in front of everybody and pausing and giving thanks giving thanks for the abundance of food that most of us have, giving thanks for the grocery store where we got our food, people that stock those shelves, the people that clean the store, the people that check out your food, giving thanks for the farmer, like someone grew that food, you know, who, who are we thanking, right? Somebody tended the land and grew the ingredients for your food. Um, the person who drove the truck, to bring the food to the distribution center, the distribution center who prepared it to go to your grocery store, right? We can just go, the, the person who made the meal, maybe you ordered from a restaurant, say thank you to those people. Maybe you're thanking, you know, someone that's sitting right there. Whatever it is, there's so many, you can just spend like two or three minutes in gratitude before 
a meal. It is one of my favorite things to do as a family. And then invite people to share one thing from their day that they're thankful for, that they're grateful for, just something that went well in their day to keep that tone going. And I'll give you the bonus of this is that it also helps your digestion. So when you pause before you eat, when you give your body a moment, your brain to recognize that you're about to eat, you have increased saliva production, then your digestive enzymes are then, you know, um, they're excreted into the stomach and the stomach acid increases. All of these things help you to better digest your food. So that is my favorite way of sharing how gratitude and gut health really intersect. Yay, I love that so much. And that's so useful as well for uh, any type of community. So if people on, the, on um, this podcast are going to create communities to really fill into, you know, into our day, you know, how could we create this gratitude circle and this energy of gratitude at lunchtime and then the reverence to the food. So I like how you're pausing and saying, okay, we need to, you know, enjoy this meal, have gratitude for it. And then on top of that, that it's also going to be helping them to process the food. And that in itself is a big paradigm shift because, you know, a lot of schools these days, you know, you have 10 minutes and that's it. And off you go and the children are eating fast, the adults are eating fast and everybody's on the go. So just that's, that in itself is a beautiful awakening and a gift for everybody to hear on um, a new paradigm of education. So thank you so much for that, Julie. Do you remember the Japanese word for all of that encompassing, Julie? Right. No, tell me again. I don't remember. It's uh, itetakimasu, um, which is rooted in, you know, the spirit of the earth and, and, and everything that allowed us to have this meal in front of us, including everything that you just mentioned. It's just an all-encompassing word. And it's nice to kind of pick it apart to get people really thinking about all the different parts of how we got there. But that one word actually encompasses in, in Japanese all of that. And so, like you said, at lunchtime, you could say all the little things with the kids and everything, but even just the word itadakimasu means such a, a volume of, of abundance and gratitude in that. So, <laughs> Thank you so much. I love that, Anish. I love how you're bringing always the language uh, diversity into the conversation. And it's amazing how much language is changing. Like one word in one language can needs like five ex explanations in another language. I love that about language as well. So interesting. Um, so thank you everybody for tuning in today to a new paradigm of education podcast. Thank you so much for being with us today, Julie, and we'll place all of your uh, information below. So if anybody's wanting to reach out to Julie around gut health or gratitude or just around anything, <laughs> we will uh, place it there. And, um, thank you for coming to host again, Anesh. It's been great to connect with you. So, um, yeah, to close, how about everybody on the podcast, close their eyes just for 10 seconds, Visualize gratitude inside your heart like a beautiful golden ball of light. Feel love and joy in there. And expansion. And just share that out in your day. You may open your eyes and just with that smile, share that out to the world. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for joining us.